Brothers and sisters, it's my great privilege uh, here this morning to introduce to you uh, our speaker, Dr. Joel Beakey. He is not in the PCA, uh, but he is no stranger, I think, to all of us here in this room. Many of you know him personally. We have all benefited from his ministry over the years. Uh, Dr. Beakey is the president of Puritan Reform Theological Seminary and also the professor of systematic theology and homiletics there. He is the author of, or co-author of over a hundred books. He has also edited over another hundred books and has literally written thousands of articles. And I know many of us have benefited from those. I remember the first time I met Dr. Beakey was at a conference after he had spoke and he immediately went to the book table. He is the best book salesman I know. Uh, he put a broccoli in my hand and he said, sell everything you have to buy this. Uh, and I did. Uh, what I most appreciate about him, and you do as well, uh, is that he is a man who loves the Lord. Uh, his preaching is warm, it is experimental, it is reformed, it is expositional, and it ministers to the soul. And what I especially appreciate about him uh, is I have ministered in East Lansing, Michigan for the past 15 years. I'm an hour from Grand Rapids. And I can tell you, having ministered to a handful of families that have come from his church, uh, what they appreciate about him is that he is a true pastor. Uh, he has pastored them well, and I get the benefit of them pastoring them as they come to me. So, welcome, Dr. Beakey. Bless us. Well, it's uh, great to be with you today. I thank you so much for the invitation. A few weeks ago, I was speaking at uh, Twin Lakes Fellowship, PCA conference. So uh, it's wonderful to be with PCA brethren again. We enjoy our PCA students at, at Puritan Reform, and we have been praying for your denomination. We realize that in many ways you're at a crossroads and you need the Spirit's direction to keep you in confessional integrity, as you heard last hour. And now we're going to piggyback on that or make, as the Puritans would say, application of that to say it's not enough just to have confessional integrity, as important as that is, but you men, you ministers in particular in the PCA, you must be men of God who are transcripts, as the Puritans would say, of the very confessions you espouse to hold, so that your life exudes with piety. So that's my subject given to me by John Payne, the Puritans and the old paths of Christian piety. I want to just read with you three verses, 1 Timothy 4, 7, through nine. Refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Or as John Kelvin translates the word there, piety. Exercise thyself rather unto piety. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness or piety is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Let's pray. Great God of heaven, we ask thy benediction upon this address, and we pray that we would not be embarrassed by the word piety, but that we would embrace it in its true and real sense, and that we would live out lives of sanctification, holiness, that are consistent with the confessions and with the word of Scripture that we so fully believe. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I suppose if you went to John Calvin and said to him, you are really a pious man. He would not be embarrassed. He would probably hang his head a bit and say, 
would to God it were so. Did you know that John Calvin, when he wrote his Institutes, said, I only wrote my Institutes, I only wrote this 1,200-page book of doctrine for one purpose, to promote pietas, piety. You see, for Calvin, piety was at the heart of what the Reformation was all about. A good case, of course, can be made for the cardinal doctrine of justification by faith alone lying at the heart of the Reformation, or the issue of biblical worship. But too often today, people forget that in the minds of the Reformers and their successors, the Puritans, the very heart of it all was this relationship with God, this attitude of with God or toward God, honoring God and living lives that reflect God's character. This is what they called biblical piety. Now, everything can be abused, of course. There's a false kind of piety. There's a legalistic kind of piety. But we ought never to let the world, or the church for that matter, impugn the cherished and treasured notion of genuine, biblical, reformed, confessional, practical, experiential piety. John Calvin, of course, earned himself the title of the preeminent systematician of the Protestant Reformation. But that reputation as an intellectual must never be viewed as apart from the vital spiritual and pastoral context in which he wrote his theology. J.T. McNeil said, Calvin's theology is nothing but his piety described at length. In his preface addressed to King Francis I, Kelvin says that the purpose of writing the Institutes was solely to, tremit, to transmit certain rudiments by which those who are touched with any zeal for religion might be shaped to true pietas. So to understand the Puritans and their notion of piety, we need to go back, first of all, to Kelvin. And what I want to do in this address is give you just 10 minutes or so on Kelvin's view of piety, and then I want to look at the Puritan view of sanctification, which to them is really synonymous with piety, and then the practice of sanctification. So first Calvin and piety, and the Puritans' idea of it, and then their practice of it. For Calvin, pietas designates the right attitude of man towards God. And he says, if you collect several of his comments in different places, this really involves six things. A true knowledge of God, heartfelt worship, saving faith, filial fear, childlike fear of God, prayerful submission to God, and reverential love for God. Combine these six things in Kelvin and you have his idea of biblical piety. And Kelvin himself summarizes it in this sentence, I call piety that reverence joined with love of God, which the knowledge of his benefits induces. Induces in my mind, induces in my soul, induces in my hands and feet. And this love and reverence for God, you see, says Calvin, embraces the totality of life. The whole life of Christians, he writes, ought to be a sort of unending practice of piety. For Calvin, the Old Testament word for piety was the fear of God. The New Testament word for piety was godliness or sanctification. And the goal of all of this, this comprehensive way of living, Kelvin said, is to promote the glory of God, that glory that shines in his attributes, in the structure of the world, and in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he says. And so he writes this, the pious man 
belongs to God. Let us therefore live for him and die for him. We belong to God. Let his wisdom and will therefore rule all our actions. We belong to God. Let therefore all the parts of our life accordingly strive toward him as our only lawful goal for living. Now this piety, Calvin says, of living all of life in relationship to God and for his glory is radically comprehensive. And for Calvin, this meant it was theological, it was ecclesiological, and it is practical. Theologically, it's grounded in union with Christ and communion that flows out of Christ so that the believer in Christ may commune with each other through the word by the Spirit. Only in Christ, Calvin writes, can the pious live as willing servants of their Lord, faithful soldiers of their commander, and obedient children of their Father. So communion with God, communion with Jesus, is always the result of the Spirit-worked faith that is pious, a work that is astonishing, experiential, even more than is comprehensible, as Kelvin says. Therefore, Kelvin says, we ought never to separate Christ from ourselves or ourselves from him, but we ought to participate in Christ by faith, for this revives us from death to make us a new creature of godly piety in Christ Jesus. Ecclesiologically, for Calvin, piety is nurtured in the church by the preached word, the holy sacraments, and psalm singing. Spiritual growth, he says, happens within the church. The church is mother, educator, nourisher of every believer, for the Holy Spirit acts in her, with her, and through her. Believers cultivate piety by the Spirit through the church's teaching ministry, progressing from spiritual infancy to adolescence to full manhood in Christ. Piety, Calvin says, is fostered through the preached word and then augmented by the communion of saints talking together about the preached word. And so the preaching of the word is our spiritual food, our medicine for spiritual health, he says. And that is ministered to us by double ministry, as Calvin calls it. The internal minister, who's the Holy Spirit, and the external minister, who's standing behind the pulpit speaking. And Calvin says, when the external minister speaks, especially when he comes to preaching Christ, The internal minister, the Holy Spirit, takes that word, puts it as arrows in his bow, and shoots it out over the congregation and directs it to every soul according to each soul's need. And the fruit of that is a mortification of sin, a vivification of the inner man, and the promotion of a lifestyle of godly piety. But that is also the purpose of the sacraments, Calvin says. The sacraments, he says, are testimonies of divine grace toward us, confirmed by an outward sign with mutual attestation of our piety toward him. The sacraments being the visible word, therefore, this is still Calvin, are exercises of piety. For the sacraments foster our faith, strengthen it, make us grateful to God for his abundant grace and help us offer ourselves as a living sacrifice of piety to God. And psalm singing for Calvin is one of the four principal acts of worship. It's an extension of prayer, he said. It's the most significant vocal contribution of people in the service of God to promote their own piety. With the Spirit's direction, psalm singing tunes the hearts of believers for glory. And finally, practically, practically, Calvin says, the church is the nursery of piety. And when the church nurses piety, the believer goes out in the world 
and experiences that such piety is the beginning, the middle, and the end, as he puts it, of all Christian living. It involves all kinds of numerous practical dimensions for daily Christian living. And you remember Calvin has a long section about that in the Institutes in which he takes up these subjects. Heartfelt prayer, repentance, self-denial, cross-bearing, and obedience. These are all subsets for Calvin of this comprehensive view of practical living piety. Now, the key thing here is that Calvin strove to live the life of Pietas himself. Having tasted the goodness of God in Jesus Christ, he pursued piety by seeking to know and to do God's will every day. That was what got him out of bed in the morning. That is what motivated him throughout the day. His theology and ecclesiology worked itself out in a practical, heartfelt, Christ-centered piety, piety that ultimately profoundly impacted the church, the community of Geneva, and the world. And it's that concept of Calvinistic piety, you see, that the Puritans now took over in full and then the Puritans applied that to every area of life in more detail than Calvin had time to do. See, the Puritans were thoroughly reformed in their theology. But you see, they didn't have to go back and hammer out, spend lots and lots of time on justification by faith or how to worship God. That was all settled. So the Puritans could take all the things, standing on the shoulders of the Reformers, all the theology of the Reformers, and they could say, now how does that apply to marriage? And so they wrote 29 books on how to live godly, or we could say pious, lives of sanctification in marriage. They wrote 41 books on how to engage in pious meditation, private meditation with God, in your daily devotions. 41 books just written on the subject of meditation. They were men who didn't really bring additional things to the table in terms of sanctification, but their emphasis on sanctification and their emphasis on living all of life to the glory of God. The emphasis on ministers being transcripts of their sermons and really living what they, and really believing what they profess, and being men of prayer and men of piety, excelled the Reformers. And they brought it home, as they said, to men's businesses and bosoms in every area of their lives. So that leads me to my second thought. What really is the idea of piety, of old paths of Christian piety, or we could say sanctification? in the Puritan mind. Owen Watkins says, the Puritans took up the work of the Continental Reformers in justification, what God had done for sinners at Calvary, and completed it with detailed studies of sanctification, what God does within the soul and within the body of believers in order to promote genuine Calvinistic piety. So for Puritans, Holiness, sanctification, piety, like for Calvin, these things are basically synonymous. Question 35 of the Shorter Catechism, you know it well, the most famous de definition of sanctification ever given. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. That's piety. Dying unto sin and living unto righteousness. The whole description here is the process of being conformed to Christ's image. And question 36 says, the benefits of that are living with an assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance therein unto the end. Now, in fleshing out this definition in their treatises and books, 
The Puritan idea of sanctification involves three important things. Number one, sanctification is always rooted in the essence of God. Always rooted in the essence of God. Holiness is God's essence, and the Puritans really believed, 1, Timothy, 1 Peter 1, be ye holy as he is holy. They said holiness is the heart of everything the Bible describes about God. Jonathan Edwards said, it's the sum of all his attributes, the outshining of all that God is. John Howe said, God's holiness is a transcendental attribute that as it were runs throughout all the rest and casts luster upon them all. Holiness is God's permanent crown, his glory, his beauty. It's what shows that he's separate from all else, all his creation, all that is evil. He is singularly holy, singularly pure, and he can only be approached by sinners through a holy sacrifice that is acceptable in his sight. And that can only be Jesus in his double obedience, as the Puritans would say, echoing Calvin again, his passive obedience paying for sin, his active obedience obeying the law fully. Out of this holy God, we, by the grace of the Spirit, are not only regenerated and justified by faith, but we also find the secret of our own sanctification and our own piety. Secondly, the Puritans would say that sanctification or sanctified piety involves both status and condition. We're not called to holiness so as to merit acceptance with God, but we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, Hebrews 10, 10, so that Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 30, is our sanctification. As a Puritan, Walter Marshall explains in his incredible book, The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification, the believer's status before God is one of sanctity in Christ on account of his perfect obedience, which has fully satisfied the justice of God for all sin. And so when I'm justified by faith alone, the Puritans would state, just stating sound Reformed doctrine, I enter into a state of sanctification. If I were to die a moment later, I would go to heaven. But now I have to also exercise the condition of sanctification. I have to live out what in principle I am, having been justified by faith. In principle, when I'm justified by faith, I am, Romans 6, 11, I am to reckon myself dead unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But to live that out, you see, that involves me in the struggle of Romans 7. The realism of Romans 7, the optimism of Romans 8, as I struggle to make progress in sanctification, struggle to push away my old nature, to mortify sin, to be vivified, and to have my new nature quicken and battle for holiness every step of the way in order to make real pilgrim's progress toward heaven, as Bunyan put it. And so as William Grinnell said, the Christian life of piety is like walking down a narrow path and there are, there, there's a, a trees on both sides of that path, a hedge on both sides is the word he used actually, a hedge on both sides. And the devil and his minions are behind the hedges with their bow and arrows. And as you run the race of the Christian life down that path, you see, if you loiter, they're there with their bow and arrows to shoot you through that hedge and to try to take you down because they hate the image of God that is forming in you. And so the entire Christian life is a race. It's a battle. It's a holy war all the way to the celestial city. But praise be God, it's a, it's a progressive holy war. Though there are ups and downs, there's progress. Thomas Watson says, sanctification is progressive. If it does not grow, it is because it does not live. 
John Preston, another Puritan, said, progressive sanctification is like, 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 like a woman pregnant with child. If she feels no movement in her room for a few days, she's very concerned. Is the child alive? So ought a Christian feel to feel, said Preston. Christianity is meant to be a living, vital, moving, striving, progressive thing. The work of sanctification, said Thomas Boston, will progress in us because of the continued application of the blood of Christ to the believer by the Spirit. And the Scottish Puritan Andrew Gray adds to that. He says, the believer does not stay at a standstill in the Christian life, but grows from one degree and measure of grace to another till he come to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. He's like the morning sun that shines more and more unto the perfect day. This is something we've lost sight of, I'm afraid, to a great deal. This, this struggle to make progress, this struggle to be more like Jesus. This is a real battle. And you see, a minister of the gospel needs to exemplify that in his own life, in the midst of the congregation. It's one thing to preach Romans 7 and Romans 8. It's another thing to live Romans 7 and Romans 8 in front of your people. They, they can hear it in your talk. They can see it in your walk. They can feel it in your prayers. This is the old path of Christian piety in Puritan teaching. And it comes out perhaps nowhere so clearly to us as the spiritual journals of the Puritans. If you read the journals, for example, and I'm embracing Puritan here in the wide sense of the word, including the Scottish, uh, of, of Thomas Boston or, or, or the journal of Thomas Shepard, the New England Puritan you begin to realize these men really walked with God. They really examined their souls. They really lived lives of piety. They really believed that though their status in holiness was conferred, their condition in holiness must be pursued. Dear brothers and sisters, may I ask you and myself this morning, are you pursuing aggressively progressively by the grace of the spirit despite all your ups and downs beside despite all your groans of of romans 7 and all your optimism of romans 8 are you living a life of sanctified piety out of christ before your congregation and in the presence of almighty god and then thirdly the third idea of puritan piety puritan sanctification is, and this is, again, why I brought in Kelvin at the beginning, it's a work that is entirely comprehensive. Listen to one of the Puritans. Holiness and piety, then, affect everything in our lives, our privacy with God, the confidentiality of our homes, the competitiveness of our work, the pleasures of social friendship, and our Lord's Day worship. No time is exempt from the call to holy piety. It must be practiced every hour of every day. In short, the call to holiness is a whole life commitment to live Godward, to set all things apart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Holiness, therefore, is a constellation of graces. Now, in explaining this sanctifying and pietistic change that the Spirit works comprehensively in believers, the Puritans spoke of the word habit, habitus, having the, the habit of grace within you that would promote this urge toward piety. I suppose we would use the word today, orientation. I am oriented toward wanting to be godly in Christ Jesus. And so the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and so on, become habits, holy habits, the Puritan called them, of acting. Habitus, habit, would produce actus, acts of godliness. Ways of reacting to circumstances that become holy orientations 
in the believer's life. So the believer keeps rejoicing, whatever may be going on. He keeps loving, whatever may be happening. He remains at peace in himself before the Lord, whatever may be transpiring. He keeps going to God for forgiveness whenever he stumbles into sin. He does not allow his conduct to be determined by what goes on around him. Rather, he strives to live out of the disposition of Jesus Christ, his orientation to Jesus Christ in every circumstance, whatever that circumstance may be. This is what Thomas Boston called habitual holiness, that is a habitual aversion of the soul to evil and inclination to good. Now that leads me then to my, my third thought, sanctification or piety in Puritan practice. And I have three or four things I want to, I want to say here as well. The first is, Puritan piety is fundamentally a pursuing of Trinitarian God-likeness in the mind of the Puritan. So that means, of course, three things. That means, first of all, I imitate the character of the Father. First Peter 1, be ye holy, for I am holy. That God's holiness, therefore, is my primary motivation for cultivating holy living. I want to be like him. Listen to the Puritan Stephen Sharnock. We do not so glorify God by elevated admirations or eloquent expressions or pompous services for him as when we aspire to a conversing with him with unstained spirits and live to him by living like him. Wow, what a test that is for ministers. You know, that's when... Really, that's where God becomes big and people become small instead of people becoming big and God becoming small. And that's what motivated John Owen to say that we also as pastors are nothing more than what we really are when we are all alone with God. Second, conforming to the image of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, servant, and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So that pattern that Paul presents us, both of humiliation and exaltation one day, in Philippians 2, becomes the pattern of godly piety of the believer as he seeks his sanctification in being conformed more and more to the image of Christ. The Puritans are following Augustine here. Augustine makes this beautiful statement. When you pursue piety, it is better to limp along on the path toward Jesus than to run outside of the path of Jesus. John Calvin said something similar. He said, you should set Christ before you as your mirror of sanctification and then seek grace to mirror him in that mirror, trusting him for holiness, for he will not disappoint you. So you can't go too much to Jesus for holiness, for he's holiness par excellence. Every speck of true holiness, true piety, true sanctification, you will ever exercise all is grounded and rooted in Christ and given to you by the Spirit and by the grace of God, you work it out as co-laborers with the Holy Spirit. And that's why Martin Luther could say, we in Christ equals justification. Christ in us equals sanctification. And then thirdly, true piety in the Puritan mind is not only striving to imitate the character of the Father and conforming to the image of the Son, but it's also submitting to the mind of the Holy Spirit. 
Romans 8, 5 and 6, where Paul, you know, divides everyone into two categories, those who are controlled by their sinful natures, carnally minded, who follow fleshly desires, and those who follow after the Spirit, who mind, who mind the things of the Spirit. And when they mind the things of the Spirit, those things penetrate their soul, their hands and their feet, the head, heart, and hands, their whole way of life. And how does the Holy Spirit do that in us? Well, he shows us our need for holiness through conviction of sin, of righteousness and judgment. He implants the desire for holiness in us. He grants Christ's likeness in holiness. He works on our whole nature, molding us after Christ's image. And then he provides strength to live holy lives by indwelling and influencing our souls. For all of that, he uses our humble feeding on the scriptures and the exercise of prayer, teaching us his mind and establishing an ongoing realization that holiness is essential to being worthy of God and of his kingdom. When I was a boy, my dad used to always say to me, remember all real communion with Jesus is a two-way street. He speaks to you through his word, by his spirit, and by his spirit, you speak back to him through prayer. And these two are a constant inter-traffic. He communing with me, I commune with him. The word, prayer, this is the Puritan ideal. You pursue imitation of the Father, conformity to the Son, and you submit your mind to the Holy Spirit desiring, and that's the heart of piety, isn't it? Desiring that your entire life would be a reflection of the truth of Holy Scripture with the Holy Spirit as supreme author. Secondly, in the mind of the Holy Spirit, or rather the Puritans, the whole idea of piety is inseparable from what I've already hinted at, mortification and vivification. Puritans use the word mortification not just to describe the, the actual act of aggressively putting the sword through sin and killing it, but also of the discipline of watchfulness, a spiritual discipline long forgotten in our day, watchfulness. Brian Hedges just wrote a, a great book for us that we just published at RHB on watchfulness. Puritans wrote a lot on that. Guarding the soul, keeping the heart, praying against sinful habits, crucifying those bosom or darling or besetting sins, and asking God for strength to really live out Romans 6, 11. Reckon yourself dead unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, Dr. Lloyd-Jones was being very Puritan-esque when he said, that text has helped me in my life more than any other text in the entire Bible to live a godly life. And how so? Well, whenever we're tempted to sin, we ought to stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got no right to sin. I'm a Christian. I'm, 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 I'm to be dead to the dominion of sin, dead to sin itself. Oh, that all sin in me were dead. I'm to be alive to Jesus Christ, my Lord. Be gone, sin. Be gone, Satan. I've got no business dealing with you. I'm a Christian. You see, that's the Puritan idea of, of mortification. They, they, they would agree with Martin Luther, who said, when Satan comes to attack me, I said, Satan, you're at the wrong address. My, my head's in heaven. To attack me, you've got to get at him. And you can't get at him because he's above you and beyond you and he's more mighty than you. So I'm victorious over you, Satan. And be gone. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. You know, Luther also said once, I never, I never pray quietly. I always pray aloud for two reasons. I pray aloud because sometimes my, my mind wanders. If I don't, and that's an abomination in the sight of God, but secondly, I want the devil even to hear my prayers. I want him to know he's a defeated foe. You see, mortification, this warfare, I'm going to kill sin. I'm going to fight against the devil. Thomas Boston, 
compares a believer to a man whose natural passions are always being put to death. His lusts, he writes, are upon the cross, nailed through and pierced to the heart, not to come down till they have breathed out their last. Galatians 5, 24. Like a dying man taking leave of friends, a Christian is always parting with his old lusts. Charles Spurgeon got it so right when he said, death should not be that terribly hard for a Christian, not only because he's going to eternal life, but because he's learned to live his entire life, dying every day to his own lusts and his own righteousnesses and living unto Jesus so that when he actually has to come to die, he just has to die one more time. You see, that inner life of dying to sin is something that is forgotten today in much of Christianity, and I'm afraid far too forgotten in our lives as ministers as well. But that's at the heart of piety, saying no to sin, and yea and amen to God for all his promises in Christ Jesus. Vivification, being exercised, being quickened from the heart to do the will of God. Vivification, said the Puritans, is, is like a man being raised from the dead, a sanctified sinner who lives godly and is truly pious, lives as if he is in another world, not conforming himself to the courses of this world, says Thomas Boston, but transformed into the likeness to those of the better world. And then finally, number three, the Puritan practice of godly piety, sanctification, involves a diligent use of the spiritual disciplines. And this is huge for the Puritans. Basically, you can divide their disciplines up into four categories. They wrote lots of books about it. Um, one of the best is Thomas Watson, The Kingdom of Heaven Taken by Force, or Heaven Taken by Storm, based on that text. John Flavel said, to pursue a diligent and constant use and improvement of all the holy means and duties to preserve the soul from sin, to maintain its sweet and free communion with God, we need to use the spiritual disciplines. And they divide them in four categories. Private, family, corporate, and neighborly disciplines. Private ones are obvious ones you know well. First of all, of course, reading and searching the scriptures. Sometimes they wrote whole books on that. Richard Greenham has a whole book on how, how to read the Bible. He's got eight chapters, one word for each chapter title. Basically, he says that we, we ought to dig in the Scriptures every day as a man digging for hid treasure. Diligence will make rough places plain, the difficult easy, the unsavory tasty. Well, hopefully, you're doing that with every sermon you prepare. But... Your people need to hear instruction on how to do that as well. I had an elder call me up one time, actually, and uh, said, I'm, I'm in a dark way. Uh, can you come over and help me? I've, I've backslidden, and I'm in, in great trouble. And I said, well, I, my bags are packed. I'm leaving for a conference in 10 minutes. I'll be back in three days. I'll come over and see you right away. But meanwhile, make sure you spend 30 minutes each day, 10 minutes reading the scriptures, 10 minutes meditating, 10 minutes praying. He said, I can't do it. I can't even pray anymore. And I, I, I don't even dare open the Bible. My whole life is an abomination to the Lord. I said, I said to him, well, you have to do it. He said, I can't. I said, you must. He said, well, it'll just be an abomination. I said, it'll be a double abomination if you stay out of the Word. When he got back three days later, there was a note on my, on my study chair, no need to visit elder so-and-so, all is well with his soul. <laughs> he just got back in the Word. He just got back in the Word. And the Puritans say, will say that again and again. You can only grow by growing in the Word. Listen to Henry Smith. We should set the Word. Henry Smith, by the way, was a Puritan. who was called the Chrysostom of the Puritans, a very gifted speaker. We should set the word of God always before us like a rule and believe nothing but that which it teaches, love nothing but that which it prescribes, hate nothing but that which forbids, do nothing but that which it commands. And perhaps John Flavel said it even better. 
The scriptures teach us the best way of living, the noblest way of suffering, and the most comfortable way of dying. You've got to be in the Word. Second, Puritans were great at meditating on the Bible as a major spiritual discipline. The art of meditation, said Thomas Hooker, is a serious intention of the mind whereby we come to search out the truth and settle it effectually upon the heart. How do you do that? Well, Puritans said basically seven steps. Number one, you pray for power to harness your mind. Number two, you then read the scriptures. You select a verse or two or a doctrine or a subject upon which to meditate. Number three, you memorize that verse to stimulate meditation. Number four, you then meditate and what you know about that verse is subject, everything you know from the book of Scripture, the book of your conscience, and the book of nature. Number five, you stir up your affections as you meditate, such as love and desire and hope and zeal and joy to glorify God. Number six, you arouse your mind to some duty or some holy resolution, which they often recorded in their diary, their spiritual journals. And number seven, you conclude with prayer, thanksgiving, and psalm singing. They always sang a psalm at the end because they said, singing abides on the memory longer as we go into the day. They would often do this early in the morning, spend 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. They never tell you the amount of time, but they'd follow this kind of seven-step process. And so they'd meditate on some truth each day. Well, that was a great blessing for their spiritual lives. And third, what they called ora et labora, pray and work, pray and work. They said you need to do both together. As you look, as you, as you uh, come before God, of course, you begin with prayer, you give priority to prayer, overwork. You pray first before you go out to work. John Bunyan says you can do more than pray after you prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you have prayed. So you give priority to prayer, you give yourself to prayer, you throw your whole heart into it. Prayer, they said, is the thermometer of your soul. And then you give room to pray. Room to prayer, literally. Most Puritans' homes had a, had a prayer room in it somewhere, just designed for prayer. Or they blocked out certain stated times, or they did both, of course, stated times for prayer. And they committed themselves to praying at those times. And then they had what they called spontaneous prayers throughout the day. And they said, if you're not living in a backslidden condition, your spontaneous prayers will outnumber your stated prayers because you'll have an attitude of prayer as you go throughout the day, asking God to help you through everything. And then you go to work in that prayerful mode, looking what you have to do that day, asking God to help you, relying on the Lord as you go through it. After you complete a task, you return to him with thanksgiving. And at the end of the day, you always ask for your forgiveness, for your shortcomings, and pray that God will help you to do better tomorrow. It was a prayerful way of living, a dependent way of living, giving theocentricity to prayer and to your walk of life. This is what the Puritans called in the words of 1 Timothy 4, 7, exercising yourself unto godliness. And then there was the family discipline, of course, the family worship especially. Also family conversation, at times outside of family worship, bringing in godly things, uh, biblical subjects, uh, biblical ways of looking at things. The head of the household was to lead his family in discussions and conversations, also outside times of family worship. But for family worship, that was a staple item to promote pietas in your family. And family worship always included four things. A daily reading of the scripture, a daily instruction by the father with the support of the mother in the scriptures read, and then a daily uh, prayer to the throne of grace and a daily singing of the praises of God. How critical that was. The Puritan mind, it was so critical that in certain Puritan churches, if a father was not doing this, he was put under quiet sense and forbidden the use of the sacraments. Because you had to do family worship. That was your primary duty. It's commanded everywhere in the Bible, they said. 
And they've written, wrote whole books about how to do it. Matthew Henry, George Hammond, etc. And then thirdly, corporate disciplines. You should make much of the diligent use of the preached word. Thomas Watson gave 10 directions on how to listen to the preached word. Alan Hur did a whole study of, of Puritan literature in the no, late 1950s, and he concluded that close to 40% of all publications in the heyday of Puritanism, 40% of all publications coming off of the, the presses in England were sermons from the Puritans. Today, you can hardly sell a sermon book. In those days, the Puritans loved the sermons because the ministers applied the sermons to their soul and taught them how to live pious lives in the good sense of the word. And people were drinking it in, reading it, absorbing it, implementing it. They wanted to live godly in Christ Jesus. And second, make diligent use of the sacraments, they said. The early Puritan Robert Bruce said, while we do not get a better Christ in the sacraments than we do in the Word, there are times when we get Christ better. And then fellowship in the church was a big one for the Puritans. Not just casual fellowship, not just how are you doing and your physical ailments, but spiritual fellowship. They had these gatherings. You know, the Dutch called them gezelsops. The, the English called them conventicles. Uh, uh, the, the Germans called it collegia pietatis, co college of piety, where they would talk together about the things of God. Thomas Watson said association promotes assimilation. What they wanted to do is they wanted you to look out for the most godly people around and befriend them and let their godliness rub off on you, having heavenly fellowship instead of hindering fellowship. And then sanctification of the Lord's Day. And by that they meant, of course, the whole Lord's Day, not just a, a Sabbath observance of going to church and then the rest of the day is for me. No, as J.I. Packer said, we are to rest from the business of our earthly calling in order to prosecute the business of our heavenly calling. And then neighborly disciplines. They called that evangelization. Evangelizing, serving others, fleeing worldliness so that your neighbors also could see that you lived a godly lifestyle, that you rejoiced in the Lord and you hated the things of sin and of this world. Now all of this, they said, in conclusion, all of this was full of benefits for the believer. Number one, you would live more to the glory of God when you pursued piety aggressively. And it would do your own soul good. For God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. And that for his glory. Holiness and piety would also make you resemble God. It would preserve your integrity in the face of the world. It will give you evidence of justification and election. And it will foster assurance in you, as, as the Apostle John does so, so, so poignantly, 11 times over in 1 John, giving you 11 marks of grace whereby you may know you are a child of God. And it will undergird effective service to God because people will feel your authenticity as you serve the Lord. And last of all, it will fit you for heaven. For heaven is a holy place of genuine piety. The heaven I desire, said Jonathan Edwards, is a heaven of holiness. For without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Well, brothers and sisters, this way, this way of godliness, this way of piety, it's not a way in itself or for itself. It's a way in Jesus. If you would be holy, you would be godly, you would be genuinely pious, the Puritans would say, you must begin with Christ. And would you continue to be holy and more holy, you must abide in Christ. Your piety is not the way to Jesus. Christ is the way to true piety. Outside of him, there is no holiness. 
So holiness isn't just a list of do's and don'ts. It's a life, a comprehensive life in Jesus Christ. He, after all, is our sanctification and our godliness. Amen. Let's pray. Great God of heaven, we thank thee so much for the godly example of the lives of the Puritans in living what they preached and in exemplifying for their people such an earnestness for their souls that it appeared to the people that they loved their souls more than they did themselves. Oh God, may we as ministers of the gospel especially be men of God, living out of Christ, filled with godliness, not embarrassed by pursuing piety, but longing to be more godly and grieving that we have not yet arrived, but longing for that day when we will be perfectly holy in glory forever. Oh God, help us. Help us with confessional integrity, but also help us with pietistic integrity in the good sense of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.